This is Sarah with RegisterNurseRN.com and in this video I'm going to be going over the sympathetic nervous system versus the parasympathetic system. And this video is part of an NCLEX review series over the neuro system along with pharmacology. And as always at the end of this YouTube video don't forget to access the free quiz. So let's get started. So in this video what we're going to be covering is we're going to be covering the anatomy of these two nervous systems where their neurons are specifically coming out, what organs they're affecting, and along with those signs and symptoms that each system is producing. Then we're gonna take it a step further and go over medications that can either inhibit or stimulate each system. Because for NCLEX, you want to know those because you need to know what to look out for in these patients. So the nervous system is made up of two systems. You have the central nervous system, which is the brain and the spinal cord. And this is where information is gonna be processed through your eyes, through your ears, through your nose. And it's gonna send it down through the spine, which is then gonna send it out through neurons through the peripheral system and it's going to do what needs to be done. Now the peripheral system, nervous system can be divided into two things, the somatic or the autonomic. And we're talking about the autonomic in this video. And the autonomic is divided into the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. Now the somatic system is the system that's responsible for your voluntary actions. For instance, you touch something hot, your body immediately senses that and you pull your arm off. So that was voluntary. But with the autonomic system, this controls our involuntary, unconscious things that we really can't control, like our internal organs, how they work, and our glands. And our peripheral nervous system is made up of cranial nerves, 12 of those, and 31 spinal nerves. And here I have each color coded and you want to make it noted where each of these are at because depending if we're talking about sympathetic or parasympathetic, the neurons are coming off certain sections. So your cranial nerves are up there in the brain stem and then we have those 31 pairs of spinal nerves. So up here we have our cervical, which there are eight of those. Then we go down here in the blue and this is our thoracic and there's 12 spinal thoracic nerves. Then we go down to our lumbar where there are five, then down to the sacral, where there are also five, and then down here to the cockadil, which there is one. So now let's take an in-depth look at these two systems side by side and see how they differ and how they are the same. Now, because they are part of the autonomic nervous system, they are unique with their neurons. They each have two neurons that are gonna to come together and synapse in a ganglia and then affect whatever organ they need to. And they differ in the neurotransmitters that they're releasing, especially in that post-ganglionic neuron. So I want you to remember that as we're talking about. Because what I'm talking about is these neurons come out, like in the parasympathetic, they come out of the brain stem and then synapse, and then they go wherever they need to. And then over here with the sympathetic, they come out of certain parts of the spinal cord and synapse, and then affect whatever organs they need to. So first let's look at our sympathetic nervous system. Okay, this system is the system responsible for stress, how we respond to stress. So it's known as the fight or flight compared to the parasympathetic, which is known as the rest and digest. The parasympathetic system cares about your ability to digest food, to reproduce, and take it easy on your body. The sympathetic system cares about your survival, getting you out of danger and preserving your life so you can live. And then once that stress, whatever's going on is gone, then this system will kick in and you can live, reproduce, and eat food. So first let's look at the sympathetic system. Okay, where are these neurons majorly coming out of? They are coming out of the thoracic and the lumbar areas. So remember that. So here we go. We have this preganglion neuron that's coming out and it is made up of cholinergic fibers, okay? So what is it going to release as its neurotransmitter in that ganglia? It's gonna release acetylcholine. So remember that. Cholinergic fibers release acetylcholine. So that acetylcholine, that neurotransmitter, is going to stimulate these postganglion neurons. And because we're talking about the sympathetic nervous system, majority of these neurons are made up of adrenergic 
fibers. So they're going to release a chemical called a neurotransmitter called norepinephrine. And this norepinephrine is going to act on specifically those alpha and beta receptors, which is why you're going to see increased heart rate with whenever the sympathetic system is stimulated, along with bronchodilation and things like that, which we're going to hit on here in a second. And another thing I want to note, because whenever we're talking about this, I really just want you to commit to memory that most of these postganglionic neurons are made up of adenergic fibers, which are going to cause that neuron to release norepinephrine because that's going to tie in with our drugs. However, like for instance, if this postganglionic neuron was going to the sweat glands, it's actually going to be made up of cholinergic fibers, which is going to release what? Acetylcholine to stimulate that sweat gland. And um, here in the sympathetic, it would actually cause you to sweat. So it's going to release the acetylcholine stimulate the sweat glands and you're going to be pouring the sweat. That's why when someone's running from that bear, they're sweating a lot. Or if this postganglionic neuron was going to the renal vessels, it's going to be made up of dopaminergic fibers, which is going to release a neurotransmitter dopamine to stimulate those kidneys. So just keep that in mind if you're studying this for nursing school or just for some other class. Now let's ask ourselves. Okay, how is this sympathetic nervous system going to stay stimulated? Because the peripheral nervous system can only do so much. Because say that we are in danger, we're running from that bear. And we're going to be running for a while because this is a strong bear and it's hungry and it's ready to get us. So we need something in our body to help supplement that and to actually produce these catecholamines and put them in our blood so we can have more of them, so we can continue running, so we can breathe better, our pupils can be dilated so we can and see what's going on. And what's going to happen coming out of that spinal cord will be another preganglion neuron and it's going to be made of those cholinergic fibers which is going to release acetylcholine but it doesn't go through a ganglia. It's going to directly stimulate our kidneys, specifically those adrenal glands, the adrenal medulla. And what does that produce? Our catecholamines. So it's going to release epinephrine and norepinephrine into that blood so we can have more of those circulating to keep us from getting eaten by that bear. So now let's look at those signs and symptoms that a person will present with when their sympathetic nervous system is being stimulated. Okay, so let's look at these organs. Okay, it's gonna stimulate the eyes and the salivary glands. What's going to happen? Because remember, it's gonna be attaching to either those alpha, beta receptors, and we have various ones of those. So with the eyes, what it's gonna do is it's going to cause the eyes to dilate so you can see your surroundings better, so you can get away. Also, it's gonna cause the salivary glands not to produce as much saliva because remember this is dealing with your survival and saliva plays a role in digestion and we can digest later so why over here you're going to see that you're going to have increased saliva production and here we don't really care it's going to really dry up so you're not going to have that next your heart and lungs are going to be affected and you have various receptors in the heart and lungs that these adenergic, the norepinephrine is going to affect. And with your heart, it's going to cause tachycardia, increase that heart rate so you can pump more blood and get away. It's also gonna increase your blood pressure. And your lungs are gonna be affected as well. You're gonna have what's called bronchodilation. So this airways open up and you can inhale more air so you can run and get out of there. Now let me throw this out. At you. Okay, you've heard of adenergic agonist and adenergic antagonist drugs, okay? So let's throw some beta agonists out there. What is a beta agonist drug going to do? It's going to cause the effects of the sympathetic system because agonist means it's with, it's working together. So if you give a person like a beta agonist drug, it's going to cause bronchodilation. They're going to breathe better. For instance, like whenever we talked about in our asthma video, we give them beta agonists like albuterol to cause bronchodilation because they're having bronchoconstriction. So see how all that's tying together. And then another thing, if we were giving like a beta antagonist, antagonist means it's going against like for instance, say a beta blocker like um, propanolol, what's that gonna do? If it's going against what's happening in the beta receptors, it's gonna do the opposite effect. It's going to cause 
the heart rate to come down. Now, also can stimulate the liver, and what's it gonna do with that? The liver, it's going to cause the liver to perform a function called glycogen lysis, or lysis, and this is gonna increase our blood sugar, so release those stores of glucose for us so we can have the energy to get out of there. Um, intestines, it's gonna slow down the mobility of the intestines because we don't care about digestion. Bladder, it's going to cause the bladder to relax. You're not gonna be urinating, you're not gonna be peeing, so it won't constrict. Like over here, we have constriction. Also relax the uterus and um, the sweating, like how we talked about earlier. And we have all those nice catecholamines going through the body to help continue this cycle for the sympathetic nervous system. Now let's look at our parasympathetic system. Okay, so again, this is the rest and digest system. So let's say that our stress stimuli is gone, we're safe, we're out of harm's way. So now our parasympathetic system is gonna kick in and it's going to allow us to relax, to kick up our feet and eat, digest that food, reproduce, do whatever, because we're no longer in danger. So in a sense, it's gonna really undo what the sympathetic system did to our body and help us recover. Because if we had the sympathetic system going on 24 seven, our heart and our body is just gonna wear out, we're gonna collapse. So we really need this parasympathetic system to come in and help us recover, maintain this balance in our life. Now there are some differences with the parasympathetic system compared to the sympathetic. And one thing is if you take a look at the preganglionic neurons versus the postganglionic neurons, notice the length. Over here in the sympathetic, those preganglionic neurons are a lot shorter and the posts are a lot longer. Compared to over here, they're a lot longer. The pre and the post are a lot shorter. So keep that in mind. Also where they originate, where they're coming out of. Over here in the parasympathetic, they're coming out of mainly the brain stem and they're messing with the cranial nerves. They're responsible for stimulating those cranial nerves, specifically three, seven, and nine. And then you also have the vagus. And I want you to remember the vagus, cranial nerve 10, because it's the longest cranial nerve and it's the most important for causing the signs and symptoms that you see in the parasympathetic system because it's targeting the heart, the lungs, the GI system. So really why you're seeing all those certain signs and symptoms in the parasympathetic is because of the stimulation of cranial nerve 10, the vagus nerve. And then it's also down in the sacral area and it's gonna simulate like the bladder and the uterus and things like that. Okay, so let's backtrack and go up here. Okay, so we have our preganglionic neuron and it's made of cholinergic fiber. So what's it gonna release? Acetylcholine. And it's gonna synapse in this ganglia up here. It's a little bit different down in these areas, so keep that in mind. And like the cranium ganglia. So synapse in there, releases a neurotransmitter. That stimulates the postganglionic neuron, which is also a cholinergic fiber. So it's going to release the neurotransmitter, acetylcholine as well. And because these are coming from cranial nerve three, seven, and nine, these are going to affect the eyes and the salivary glands. So your eyes are going to constrict instead of dilate, and you're gonna produce some saliva. Then have the same concept coming out with the vagus nerve, releases acetylcholine, but this is gonna synapse in a terminal ganglia, which is within the plexus of that visceral organ that it's affecting. So it's affecting the heart, the lungs, the GI system. And here in a second, we'll cover those signs and symptoms. Then down the sacral area, you have the preganglionic neuron, which is gonna release again acetylcholine, and, effect, and it's actually going to synapse in the wall of the organ at the pelvic ganglia. And then the postganglia is gonna release acetylcholine and affect its organ. Now let's look at those signs and symptoms that will present when that parasympathetic system is stimulated. And it's gonna be the opposite of the sympathetic system because we need to undo everything that happened over here when we were stressed. So with these cranial nerves, what's gonna happen when they're stimulated, especially these up here, the eyes, the pupils are going to constrict. Instead of being dilated, they're gonna relax and constrict. Our saliva glands are gonna produce more saliva because we're ready to eat. We've got to get more food to replenish our body from its energy it's lost, like our glucose and build up 
everything else that we've lost over there. So saliva plays a role in digestion, so we'll have increased to that. Also, our heart and lungs is gonna be affected. Instead of beating super fast and helping us dilate our airways to breathe, the heart's gonna slow down and it's gonna relax, which is going to relax the arteries and lower our blood pressure, and our bronchioles don't need to be not nice and dilated anymore. They're gonna relax downward, so bronchoconstriction. Also, the stomach and the GI system, it's gonna increase gastric motility because you're gonna get food in there and it's going to play a role in absorbing that and then bowel, move, bowel movements can happen along with the bladder which will allow the bladder to constrict, contract and which will help with voiding. So as you can see, whenever we are super stressed, our sympathetic system is gonna be an overdrive, helping us survive, but the parasympathetic system is gonna kick in, help us relax, eat, rest, digest, and continue life. Now let's switch gears and look at the medications that can stimulate each of these systems because sometimes we want these systems to be stimulated based on what's going on with the patient. First, let's look at the sympathetic. Why in the world would we want to stimulate a fight or flight response in a patient? Well, a patient who is on the verge of death, they're in shock, their blood pressure, super low, they're not doing good, or maybe they're having severe bronchoconstriction from an anaphylactic reaction, we need to save their life because their sympathetic nervous system really isn't doing its job. So we can give them medications and these category drugs are called sympathomimetics, mimetic, hence mimics, it mimics the uh, sympathetic nervous system. And these are also called adrenergic agonists. And the reason we just learned is because that postganglionic neuron is made of adrenergic fibers, which release the neurotransmitter norepinephrine and cause all those fight or flight response. So what are some drugs? We have dopamine, we can give this in a drip and titrate it based on whatever we want for our parameters. This will help increase blood pressure, and increase cardiac output. It can also act on those alpha and beta receptors to increase renal perfusion. Another thing we can give is a nor norepinephrine, also called the brand name Levofed. That's one of those drips we can give, and this can help increase blood pressure. Another thing is epinephrine, like in the EpiPen, a patient having an anaphylactic reaction, give that to themselves, it will cause bronchodilation and they can breathe and not have the anaphylactic reaction. So can you see that these right here are stimulating our sympathetic nervous system because at this point in time we need it. Another thing like I talked about earlier were the beta 2 adrenergic agonists and these can be prescribed in the inhaled route and you can give this to patients who are having respiratory problems like COPD, asthma, and those drugs include like albuterol, solumeterol. Um, albuterol is a short acting and solumeterol is a long acting. Now, let's look at our side effects. Okay, so what are you gonna expect to see in these patients who are having these drugs? Because our sympathetic nervous system is being stimulated. So you're gonna see symptoms of the sympathetic nervous system being stimulated. So how's the heart rate going to be? Going to be high or low? It's going to be high because we got a fight or flight response going on. So that's going to happen. How do you think their blood glucose is going to be? Well, if they're on these for long enough, being stimulated, got the fight or flight response, we have our liver performing glycogen oolysis. So it can be increased. So we can have hyperglycemia. Got to watch out for that. How are they gonna feel emotionally if they're on this for a long time? They're gonna be nervous. They're gonna feel jittery because they have this constant stimulation of this sympathetic nervous system. And it's really made for us to get out of danger, but here these patients need this. How are the mucous membranes going to be? Are they gonna be really moist or are they gonna be dry? They're gonna be dry because our body doesn't care about digesting food whenever we're on these because this is being stimulated and we can worry about that later. Now let's look at the drugs that stimulate the parasympathetic system. Okay, these drugs are called parasympathomimetics. So they're gonna mimic the parasympathetic system. And these drugs are also referred to as cholinergic drugs, which is a lot easier to say. 
And a type of drug I wanna point out because we are gonna be covering myasthenia gravis and which is gonna be part of our neuro series. So a drug that has cholinergic effects on the body is called pyridostigmine. And what is going on in myasthenia gravis? Well, a lot of patients are different depending on their signs and symptoms, but they can struggle with muscle weakness. And a lot of times they'll have facial drooping or eye problems, so they'll have weakness in the eyes or in the face. And a lot of this, in a nutshell, is due to the decreased acetylcholine receptors. And remember, we just learned from our anatomy that we just went over that those cholinergic fibers and those postganglionic neurons release acetylcholine, which is going to help with all those cranial nerves being able to do their job in the face and in the eyes. Well, if we don't have enough of those, that's not being stimulated. So it's just gonna droop and it's not going to be able to have its contraction and be able to present correctly. So you can give this drug, throw more of it, which can cause the cholinergic type effect so it can contract and the drug can help that patient maintain normal muscle function. So that was, that's where we'd actually want to cause a cholinergic effect. Now, if a patient's taking this, what's gonna, what are some side effects? Well, the side effects are gonna be what would happen with our parasympathetic nervous system being stimulated, because we're stimulating that system. So what's gonna happen with their pupil size? They're gonna have smaller pupils, so they're going to constrict. And what is going to happen with saliva? Are they gonna have issues with lots of saliva in the mouth? Yes, they're gonna have constant increased um, production of saliva, which can be troublesome for many patients. Also, because we're increasing that, mucus production is going to be increased. So they can struggle with coughing because in those airways, goblet cells producing all that mucus, we can have increase of that. So increased mucus can lead to coughing. And what was another thing that those cholinergic drugs, um, the parasympathetic system can do? It stimulates gastric, the intestines motility. So what's gonna happen? Those intestines are constantly gonna be moving. They may not be digesting their food very well, so they can suffer with diarrhea, stomach pains, and cramping. Now let's look at drugs that inhibit each system. Okay, so sympathetic system. Okay, drug categories are called sympatholytic, and they're also referred to as adrenergic antagonists. And we talked a little bit about this earlier. So what these drugs are gonna do is that they're gonna stop that nerve impulse and that postganglionic neuron and stop that neuron from releasing that norepinephrine so you don't get the increased heart rate, bronchodilation, all of that. So it's blocking that. So what kind of signs and symptoms do you think it would cause? It would lead to the opposite, so parasympathetic type sim symptoms. So why would you want to initiate or stop a sympathetic nervous system response if the patient is has hypertension, high blood pressure, or they have like an anxiety disorder because all those are signs and symptoms of the sympathetic system being initiated. So some types are like beta blockers and they can be selective or non-selective depending on what receptor they target and that can help lower the heart rate. For instance, like propanolol, sodol, things like that. So how do you expect it to work? What are the side effects of these medications? Well, they're gonna cause the opposite. So you give someone propanolol, they have tachycardia. That's why you would give it. Um, so what would it do? It would lower the um, heart rate. So it would decrease heart rate. And one thing you would wanna watch out for is decreasing the heart rate too low, so bradycardia. Airway, what's something that can happen with these? Well, you can, they can cause bronchoconstriction, which is why you have to watch out whenever you're giving patients who are receiving those non-selective beta blockers because they can target the receptors in the lungs, the beta receptors in the lungs, and it can cause bronchoconstriction. So you wouldn't wanna do that with a patient with asthma. So it could constrict possibly if it is one of those non-selective tops also, it can help bring down the blood pressure as well because since we're having some parasympathetic signs and symptoms because we're stopping the sympathetic system. Okay, so parasympathetic, what are some drugs that can inhibit that response? Well, parasympatholytic drugs, also called anticholinergic. Now, remember the other ones were cholinergic. So these are anticholinergic. So it's stopping 
that postganglionic neuron, which is made up of cholinergic fibers from releasing that acetylcholine. So you're not gonna get that response. So in the flip side, you're gonna get like signs and symptoms that you would see in the sympathetic nervous system. So they can target various areas of the body. And some things I just want to throw out to help you understand this, like for instance, with the airway, say this patient has asthma. They can't really tolerate one of these other drugs that dilate the heart rate, like, I'll, I mean, dilate the respiratory system like albuterol because it can cause tachycardia and makes them really nervous. So instead, you could give them an anticholinergic bronchodilator like ipratropin, and that can help with that and dilate the lungs instead of having constriction because cholinergic, remember, allowed bronchoconstriction and said we want to dilate. So this is doing the opposite. Also, you can give a drug that can affect the heart. So what drug can do that? If a patient is having episodes of severe bradycardia, what's one of those drugs that we get to increase the heart rate? Atropine. So we can give atropine to increase the heart rate. That's one of those anticholinergics. So it would increase. Also, atropine can be given to dilate the pupils after surgery or if they have something wrong with their eyes like inflammation or something like that where they would need to dilate the eyes. So it would do the opposite of what a cholinergic drug would do, which could constrict the pupils. So this will dilate the pupils. Okay, so that wraps up this review of the sympathetic nervous system versus the parasympathetic. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to take the free quiz and to subscribe to our channel for more videos.